Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MS Pitts. This is Ukraine War News Update, second part there after the 26th of November 2024. Sorry that my last video was so long. It, I'm including a lot of economic stuff at the moment because I think it's so important. I may have to split that out. I don't know. Put it in the geopolitical video. I don't know. Anyway, uh, this is going to be fairly chunky because there's a very long thread in one of these. But let's get on with military aid and assistance to Ukraine and Russia. We're going to start with a correction. Yesterday, I wasn't sure uh, with the wording uh, about the Drone Capability Coalition and the announcement of 1.8 billion euro boost from member countries. Uh, it sounded like that was going forward for the next year or by the end of this year. It turns out that's pretty much what they have been pledged or received, what they've received already from that coalition. And that could be why they said to the end of the year. So it could be that, that that's what's been apportioned until maybe the end of December uh, from the 17 member countries. So there's a little bit of um, uh, correction there. Right. OK, we're going to start with what I was dooming about at the end of the last video, which is this CBS News poll. Uh, and it is just one poll, but it is definitely um, a a movement of thought in, in the US. And I think it's, you know, if this is indicative of the real situation in, U in the US concerning support for Ukraine, then I think that Russian disinformation and the pervasive Russian narrative that has seeped into the US discourse and political discourse uh, is is largely to blame. Now, do you think the US should or should not send weapons to or and military aid to Ukraine? 49% say they should, 51% say they should not. That's really divisive now. And that's a that's a marked shift. Now, hopefully that's not a, a, a decent survey. Hopefully, the methodologically it is it is short of where it should be, but yeah, I don't know. I'm a little bit scared about that. Right. On the other hand, says French aid to Ukraine, 69.6% .6 of French people believe that France must continue its military support for Ukraine, while 15.4% think it should stop. That's a huge difference. And we are possibly getting to this stage where it's going to be Europe and we really are forgetting about the US. The US has just uh, taken a turn for the worse. It's a little bit ill. It's taken some time off. Uh, it'll be back in four years. Um, who knows? There's, there's some really interesting sort of wargaming one could do about the political situation in the US at the moment. Because if it's true, if he's going to do what he says, he's, he's literally just saying at the moment, the last 24 hours, that you're going to put he's going to put 10% tariffs across the board on all Chinese goods. And is it 25% tariffs on Canadian and Mexican goods? I mean, when you know the amount of oil that comes down from Canada in the north, when you know about all the fruit uh, and foodstuffs that come up from Mexico, then these are hugely inflationary. And when the population is promised that, yeah, the economy is going to be great, blah, blah, blah. And then the American economy is really, if you're taking on the American economy at the moment as a new government, it's operating really, really well. Don't change what ain't, don't fix what ain't broke. It ain't broke. Lots of people are saying, oh, Inflation has been bad, but actually they're really thinking back to just post-COVID and under the Biden administration when it was bad due to global situations. But it's got better and things are operating really well. If you come in and go, right, we're going to change this, going to put tariffs, 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 do this, do that, do, you know, get rid of 13 million or even several million uh, illegal immigrants, you are going to have inflation and you'll start getting uh, a bit of kickback to what is actually a very close electoral decision. So people... Don't many people don't realize that the American election was exceptionally close? It's one. Of, it's the seventh closest election since 1864 or something. Because a lot of the votes come in after a long time after the election, you get this situation where by California is continuing to count, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the the gap has has, has shrunk to 1.6 percent, uh, which is actually relatively small. Um, gap. It's a very wide victory for Trump, but very shallow. Point of saying all this now is, is in this video is that the mandate that Trump has is relatively thin. 
Lots of people are going to tell you it's a, it's a landslide, but actually when you've got people who are voting on things that then find out that actually that wasn't what I was promised and or wasn't what I thought was going to happen, you might get a bit of kickback and you might get in, I know this is two years down the line, but you might get midterms whiplash uh, in 2026. The point being for this video is that I don't know that Trump's administration has got a massive mandate to shaft Ukraine. And there are still, so, so what was it? A three to one Senate, Republicans, I think, voted three, or the Senate in general, three to one in support of Ukraine aid on the appropriations bill. And most of those senators are still in place. So in terms of the Senate, you still have support for Ukraine. The, the, the people that count there, okay, the House might be might be a little bit different. But this, even then, you actually had a really good bipartisan support in within the White House, within Congress, for aid to Ukraine. And I, I don't know. Yes, you're going to have a Trump administration who will want fealty, not just loyalty, but fealty. So there's a dynamic that shifted. But I'm, I'm you know, fingers crossed that actually some reality might hit the White House and, and when they start having meetings with European allies and global allies, it might be the, that actually there's a bit of a change of course. And we could talk about Sebastian Gorka, actually. I've got that lined up for the geopolitical video. Someone who I despise in, in the incoming Trump administration actually calling Putin um, out for who he is and saying that, that you know, it's very much the Kellogg Fleiss peace plan that it, that if Russia don't come to the negotiating table, they can give Ukraine loads of weaponry. Well, Gorka was talking about flooding Ukraine with weaponry. So here's someone that, that mm, I'm not a fan of at all and is one of the people I'd be think very likely to side with Russia. It's actually said some really pro, or at least anti-Russian stuff. So, you know, there are elements of hope within the administration and, and the political landscape isn't as solid as some people think for the Republicans, although they, they, they did win a clear victory. Right. OK. Now, in that context, Europe is to boost military support for Ukraine. So th there is a narrative going on here. A German uh, defence minister, Pistorius, Boris Pistorius, has said, the statement was made today after talks with the British, French, Italian and Polish counterparts on strengthening defence efforts following Donald Trump's return to the White House. Quote, our goal should be to give Ukraine the opportunity to act from a position of strength. Then you add to this the following. British Secretary of State, says Max24 for Defence, John Healy, believes that support for Ukraine should be doubled and a joint position of the five most militarily powerful European states, again, Europe, um, sorry, UK, Germany, France, Italy and Poland, will help contain the expansion of Russian aggression. Quote, we will continue to strengthen our support for Ukraine. As the war in Ukraine enters a critical phase, it is time for us to strengthen our collective defence. We are working together to strengthen NATO's eastern flank. We are working together to strengthen cooperation in the development of air defence systems and long-range missiles. We are working together to strengthen industrial programs between our leading companies. That is exactly what we want to hear. Now, the European Commission uh, proposes to allocate 1 billion euros from the proceeds from ro frozen Russian assets to the development of Ukrainian defence industry, according to Militiani. Now, I don't know if that is extra funding um, or, or it'll be part of the 50 billion overall funding. So I, I presume it's just saying, actually, here's the money we're giving to the EU's um, component part of that. Here's the money we've given, but one billion is going to be allocated to the defence industry in Ukraine. Um, or whether this is just extra stuff they found, I don't know. Uh, NATO has endorsed sending Ukraine all the means, including medium range missiles, quote, to defend itself and deter further aggression. This is stated in Resolution 494, which is adopted by, adopted by the Plenary Assembly. So NATO been meeting, it appears, because we're here, we hear. We have NATO may strike Russian weapon systems if Russia attacks first, said Dutch Admiral Rob Bauer. His remarks follow Russian ruler Vladimir Putin's threats of retaliation over Western long range missile use against targets in Russia. So you are starting to see. So on the one hand, I've been dooming about the state of affairs in the US. But on the other hand, the Europe seems to be recognising that this is an inflection point And we are at a terribly important point in, in military and political history. And Europe needs to step up where the US is receding. 
and they are at least at the moment saying the right things. The, the, the difference is money and action. So the, rhetorically, the things are being said that we would want to be said. NATO is also saying the right things. Uh, so it's, it's about meeting that ideal with cash and equipment. I mean, the big worry is boots on the ground. Ukraine desperately needs more people. And this is where I think one of the only viable options is to have troops on the ground in Ukraine in the West to free up Ukrainians. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Right, Shashan Joshi is at a, an Atlantic Future Forum, which is NATO people and, and whatnot. Just heard a senior official trot out the line on how Russia and China have no real allies a la NATO. Maybe not, but a strange line of argument when North Korea has just sent thousands of combat troops and millions of shells. Adversary alignment can't be wished away. So the idea that, oh, look at us, we're great, we've got NATO and Ch Russia doesn't have NATO. They effectively do. They signed a bilateral agreement with North Korea and get a load of this. North Korea have actually sent 11,000 troops and 9 million shells to Ukraine, to Russia. So, well, OK, so what? They don't have NATO. They've got something far more um, impactful, one might say. I mean, it is just North Korea and there are limits to what North Korea can do and the quality of what they give and, and the... Uh, the economy that North Korea has, for example. But, you know, they are they are a good ally, you could argue. An official has just said that Trump's early appointment of an ambassador to NATO is encouraging because it shows a continued centrality the alliance plays in American thinking. Some pretty remarkable spin there when you consider the nominee in question. That is remarkable. I was listening to an analysis this morning that actually Whitaker, the guy, Matthew Whitaker, that's been put forward to, for NATO, is absolutely the wrong pick he's completely like he has absolutely no knowledge at all of anything to do with international diplomacy of that kind of level and people are worried that he is basically just a kind of trump yes man and therefore is just going to mess nato up in a way that trump wants so this is yeah it's an early appointment but it's not a good appointment in any way shape or form uh, a lot of congratulatory black backslapping on Operation Interflex. So that's a training in the UK with lots of other nations helping. And other European training for Ukrainians. Training is working because war is a thousand plus days, says one senior military official. No one has reflected on training failures and shortcomings, e.g. drone inoculation, lessons from last year's failed offensives. NATO is setting up a joint lessons learned centre in Poland with Ukraine, says one former official. Idea is to learn from Ukraine, but also to make uh, more than more interoperable with Ukraine. So in other words, to get Ukraine up to NATO standards. Um, NATO has its own lessons learned centre in Portugal, I think. A lot of data required to learn granular lessons probably isn't shared at NATO classification. UK, among others, have done national lessons learned processes, uh, says uh, Shashank Joshi. Okay, but he also says, tip to organisers of conferences, if you're going to make it Chatham House rule, make sure panellists are saying something that they wouldn't, wouldn't say on record. In other words, say something new, say something, ooh, there is no point in hearing from serving officials who are too afraid to say anything of substance on the incoming Trump administration. This is really interesting. The, the, the idea from Shashant Joshi is that lots of people are properly um, apprehensive, anxious, worried of uh, of the ramifications of the incoming Trump administration. But they're actually too scared to talk about it. The US is so kind of all powerful and uh, Trump is is becoming all the more autocratic that if you say something, and he's thin skinned, that if you say something uh, really controversial, it could end up biting you on the arse. So the problem is that then you can't say what you really think. There's this, there's this self-censoring that's going on that, that's counterproductive. It means you can't deal with the problems openly. Now, uh, on the UK front, according to a report from Bloomberg, the UK quietly supplied Ukraine with dozens of additional Storm Shadow air launch cruise missiles in late October and early November before approval was given by the US, Britain and France for the long range strikes at military targets inside Russia. This is really good news. Uh, and dozens is not too bad. I mean, they could go just in, in two or three uh, forays, but yeah, Ukraine def desperately need as many cruise missiles as possible. That's why the Jasms coming from the US might 
be super, super important. Let's talk about long range strikes. And this is a long thread. This is from Daniela from Tochni, who I've interviewed a number of times or chatted with. Uh, long range strike LRS weapons have emerged as a critical element in Ukraine's war strategy, enabling precision strikes on Russian military infrastructure, logistics and command structures, uh, he says. And there's an infographic that you can uh, you can look at uh, for your delectation. Long range missile strike, uh, long range strike weapons. Sorry, provide strategic impacts beyond the battlefield by targeting critical locations behind enemy lines. Their main functions include counter population, strategic interdiction, counter leadership, and counter force within the 300 kilometer range. Our map highlights numerous high values. So that there's a map he's got with high value um, targets all over. Uh, Russia uh, and you can see you know what Ukraine might be able to hit might want to hit air bases or refineries ammo depots distilleries because they're involved in the explosives um, so on and so forth right within the 300 kilometer range our map highlights numerous high value targets uh, concentrated along Russia's western border and adjacent to Ukraine these include critical ammo depots such as those near Belgorod and Kursk which are vital for supplying frontline operations. Several railway substations also fall within this range, forming essential nodes for logistics and transporting troops and supplies. Additionally, key air bases like the Shaikovka and Voronezh Malshevo house uh, of 222M3 and Su-34 um, fighter bombers or bombers respectively could be hit. Regarding oil production, at least uh, five oil refineries in the southwestern regions of Russia are present within with a combined output of 31.3 million tons per year extending the range to 560 kilometers allows for strikes deeper into russia's uh, central regions notably the 68th arsenal grau and the 50th arsenal grau of all considerable significance due to the presence of 18 soviet era ecms uh, and a production site located adjacent so those ecms i think are those um, built in uh, structures that house uh, lots of uh, equipment. Uh, key air bases such as those near uh, Ulyanovsk, along with railway substations critical for transportation, become accessible. Additionally, the three oil refineries, which account for an annual production of 36.3 million tons of oil, are located within this area. And then moving out to 700 kilometers of range, the range dramatically expands to cover strategic assets deep inside Russia's interior, including areas near and beyond Moscow, Yekaterinburg in the Caspian Sea. Uh, key examples of targets include large ammo depots around Moscow, counter population, deterrence through retaliation, modern warfare often targets civilian morale and infrastructure exemplified by Russia's attacks on Ukraine's power grids and heating facilities. It has been estimated that 2022 period alone cost Ukraine $9 billion. Notably, in 2023, the use of missiles and drones have seen a similar trend with Shahid 1036s accounting for 58% of all strikes in the second half of the year. This allows Russia to stop our cruise missiles for the campaign against electrical infrastructure. So you can see that Shahids have been uh, responsible for most of the um, the the pie here, fifty six percent of all aerial threats sent into R Ukraine. Uh, it uh, the continued use of long range strike weapons has severely impacted Ukraine's power generation uh, capabilities since early twenty twenty four. Intensified attacks have taken down around two thirds of Ukraine's pre war energy capacity, and there's a decline of Ukraine's power capacity there in that chart strategic interdiction disrupting logistics so lrs can significantly impact russian supply chains by targeting logistics routes and supply depots with russian forces relying on long supply lines from their territory into ukraine it's important to understand how russian logistics work at various distances from the front line and a good summary can be found in the l image here elaborated uh, by tochny uh, based on uh, one posted previously by matiej korowaj uh, and yes, I mean, that's quite a complex um, infographic there discussing the logistics uh, m mechanisms in um, in Russia. A layered logistics system divided into front line, 0 to 85 kilometers, near front, 85 to 150, and deep logistics, 150 to 300 kilometer zones. Uh, front line logistics may hi um, are highly dynamic with supplies like ammunition and fuel delivered from CSS combat service support hubs within 50 kilometers. So whacking things on a truck and driving it down little roads here and there. 
um, compared to what might happen on railway deep into Russia. In the near front zone, 85 to 150 kilometers, logistics rely on larger supply hubs supporting divisional and core level units. Rail and truck operations ensure the transportation of up to 50 wagons of supplies with trucks maintaining three to four daily trips. Beyond 150 kilometres in the deep logistics zone, central storage depots manage vast reserves of up to 5,000 wagons. Rail networks are the backbone here, moving massive quantities of supplies via, in some cases, 700 metre long trains carrying up to 15,000 tonnes. The entire system has already been put under strain by first-person view drone attacks which have seen a great increase in the number of observed strikes on trucks and transport vehicles. The two graphs show how the data collected by Andrew Perpetua uh, show the data collected by Andrew Perpetua and his team. So you've got destroyed, uh, abandoned and damaged trucks per month and loafs lost. Those are the Bikankas, the kind of Scooby-Doo vans and how that might affect logistics. The ATACM's Army Tactical Missile System, Storm Shadow, Scalpy, G and Taurus uh, missiles are highly effective tools for disrupting Russia's layered logistics system, particularly in the deep and near front logistics zones. Atakans with a published range of up to 300 kilometers is ideally suited for striking critical hubs within the near front. Um, uh, the near front zone, 85 to 150 kilometers, such as divisional supply depots, railroads, and ammunition stockpiles. Storm Shadow and Taurus, with their published a range of up to 560 and 700 kilometers, respectively, can go deeper, targeting central storage depots for 150 to 300 kilometers, and rail hubs essential for moving massive quantities of supplies. Its precision makes it effective on high value targets. These missiles allow for the comprehensive degradation of Russian logistics, hitting both immediate resupply lines near the front and the deeper stockpiles that replenish them. Strikes on rail networks and depots in the deep logistics zone create cascading effects as they disrupt the bulk transportation of supplies to the near front hubs which then impact frontline operations counterforce engaging military assets at distance lrs so these long-range strikes allows ukraine to strike at russian military assets such as artillery positions and supply hubs before their stocks reach the battlefield among many targets within the range include the 120th arsenal of grau the arsenal is known for storing different types of vehicles in addition the arsenal is a key point for artillery repair by targeting infrastructure like this ukraine can diminish russian offensive capabilities enhancing the attrition rates um, at the front line the pursuit of this strategy is particularly important because russian artillery employs a broad range of artillery calibers um each tailored to specific operational roles, but creating significant logistical challenges. And there are some info or some tables on the screen for you to consider. A critical consideration in the domain of artillery is ammunition compatibility, particularly within the 152 millimeter class. While it might appear that all systems of the same caliber can share munitions, this is not the case. For example, the 2A36 Jetson B towed and 2S5 Jetson S self-propelled uh, howitzers utilize specific types of ammunition that are not interchangeable with those used by other 152 mil systems like the S23 Akatsia or D20 howitzer. Uh, another aspect to highlight is the reintroduction of older artillery systems such as the D1 152 mil and M30 122 mil. While these systems share calibers with more modern artillery pieces, they are fundamentally incompatible in terms of ammunition. These compatibility issues pose significant logistical challenges, particularly in mixed unit operations or when relying on stockpiles containing different ammunition types. Wartime conditions exacerbate these issues, resulting in bottlenecks due to high demand. You Ukraine's drone campaign has achieved significant results in degrading and disrupting Russian assets far beyond the front lines, focusing on key infrastructure logistics and industrial targets across Russia. Recent strikes have targeted a diverse range of facilities, such as ammunition depots, oil refineries, power stations, and even alcohol distilleries, severely impacting Russia's logistical and energy capabilities. And um, we're just coming to the end here. So Ukrainian drones have also severely damaged several oil depots, including facilities in the Rostov and Kirov regions. The attack in Rostov Oblast targeted a depot where explosions led to the extensive blaze, temporarily shutting down local fuel storage ca uh, capabilities capacities. The strikes highlighted Ukraine's use of domestically produced drones, which provided both a cost-effective and strategic advantage. Ukraine's rationale for those operations extended beyond critical, um, sorry, tactical 
uh, damage. While some sources suggest that refinery production recovered relatively quickly after repairs, the cumulative cost of disruptions and repairs for Russia was significant and the sanctions imposed by the West had a role in delaying the purchase of parts and components. Um, conclusions. The case for providing Ukraine with long-range strike weapons like ATAC and Storm Shadow Scout PG and potentially Taurus is not merely of tactical importance, but strategic, combating multiple dimensions of the ongoing conflict in other words these weapons aren't just used to blow up a thing behind a hill over there some kind of advantage you would get for taking this village so we can blow up that and take out that we can take that village well done we've got a village it's not operational although these are all important as well but it's actually strategic like russia's ability to uh to prosecute the war like to get their stuff to from russia to the war zone uh, it affects their ability to uh, produce, extract, uh, refine, produce hydrocarbons and deliver those hydrocarbons abroad to make money to prosecute the war or for fuel for the war. So th these are insanely important. Um, these weapons allow Ukraine to offset its numerical and resource disadvantages by targeting critical infrastructure, logistics and command structures deep within Russian controlled territory by disrupting supply lines, degrading enemy leadership and command cap capabilities and impeding military operations far from the front lines. LRS can reshape the battlefield dynamics in Ukraine's favour. Thank you very much to uh, Daniela and Tochny for that analysis. Really appreciated. Now. Speaking kind of, of of which, Umarov, Rustam Umarov, the defence minister, will visit South Korea and request uh, a supply of weapons to Ukraine. And that could include those, who knows. A Ukrainian delegation led by Defence Minister Umarov is preparing to visit South Korea to discuss the possibility of receiving military aid from them. Uh, but on Taurus, Olaf Scholz has reiterated uh, that he will not provide Taurus. Um, I stand by what I said precisely because we are the biggest supporter of Ukraine's ability to defend itself. We are not doing certain things. Um, and that is both providing tourists and allowing Ukraine to fire deep into Russia. But of course, they're not using German stuff to fire deep into Russia. And he said, interestingly, that his phone call and basically all phone calls with Russia are unpleasant with Putin. It was necessary to do that at the time. It was not a pleasant conversation, but you have to talk. Um, Germany is to deliver two RST air defence systems to Ukraine by the end of the year. According to the MOD, Germany will supply uh, an initial two RST defence systems, including a medium-range SLM and a short-range SLS model uh, by the end of the year. So good news there. Now, Max24 reports, over the past few days, uh, this is a quote from Christian Freuding, we have delivered artillery howitzers, tanks, MARDA IFVs and have launched our strike drone program. And the next IRST, SLM and SLS systems should arrive in, to Ukraine before Christmas. So it's not just those. There are other things that Germany are consistently doing, as I often report. Now, in terms of troops going to Ukraine, I said I'd come back to this. David Lammy, the UK's foreign secretary, has had to come out. Well, he hasn't had to. I don't know. I think there should just be strategic ambiguity. Just don't say anything. My opinion is always just if in doubt, don't say anything. But unfortunately, Lamy has backed the UK into a constraint, although there are some caveats applied. Quote, we are not committing UK troops to the ground, on the ground to Ukraine, but we continue to support Ukraine with training and military assistance, UK Foreign uh, Secretary has said. So let's have a look at that. Um, we have, okay, uh, it's, uh, it, this is in response to the Le Monde article that said that we're, the UK and France were discussing this. Quote, we are not committing UK troops on the ground to Ukraine, but we continue to support Ukraine with training and military assistance. And we have absolute, been absolutely clear that we will continue to do so for as long as required and is needed. That is certainly the UK position and remains the UK position. Here's the important part. At this time. And I, and I, I love that. So if you are going to paint yourself into a corner, at least say, at least for now, that just those three words allow you to say, yeah, but we might change. Um, now, I uh, I have seen this kind of interpreted as talking about troops, combat troops. It doesn't necessarily concern, you know, troops going to do other things into the west of Ukraine. Uh, he, he says UK troops on the ground. Uh, and that could be that could be interpreted 
maybe in two ways, but I think generally that means troops at all inside the borders. Now, Estonian Defence Minister Hanno Pevka said Ukraine needs investment in its military industry, not foreign troops. He says that the risks outweigh the benefits, even as Ukraine faces manpower challenges and Russia bolsters forces with North Korean troops. I think I. I think it's something that needs to be discussed. And if they, even if you're going to discuss it with a view not really going to do it, discuss it to give Russia a signal that we can, we are prepared to take big and bold moves. Uh, also from Estonia, we are in the process of establishing a defence industrial park. We have at least... Uh, three or four companies who are interested in starting production of the large caliber ammunition, including 155 mil. So with the recession of the US from the uh, potentially from supporting Ukraine, so many other nations need to step up. Now, here's a piece from the Daily Express. Take it with a pinch of salt. It is a very Yahoo um, jingoistic UK tabloid. Uh, very nationalistic, but it is uh, the UK Challenger 2's tanks, Tan Challenger 2 tanks outperform their American cousins on the battlefield in Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian forces operating British supplied Challenger 2 tanks have praised their accuracy and survivability as they continue to use the kit inside Russia. The tanks were provided um, by the UK back in January 2023. Um, a tank co commander said it works like a sniper. His comrade, who serves as a loader, agrees with his boss's praise. If two tanks appear, one at 1,800 metres and another at 2,300 metres, a laser measurement is taken for both tanks. A computer stores the data for both targets. When a commander decides which one to engage, the gunner can simply switch between the targets and press of a single button. Praise of the Challenger 2 comes in contrast to recent Ukrainian criticism of the US Abrams tank for its insufficient armour. Uh, one crew member using the tank, known by the call sign Joker, said the tank's armour is not sufficient for this moment. It doesn't protect the crew. For real today, this is a war of drones. So now the tank rolls out and always try to hit. They always try to hit them. Uh, I wonder if it's because it's been stripped of its um, of, of some of its more uh, um, technologically advanced armour because it didn't want the depleted uranium armour on the tank, so I don't know if that's got anything to do with it. In addition, Ukrainian soldiers have expressed concerns about the Abrams tank's armour, according to the report in the Eurasian Times, suggesting it may not be adequate to withstand modern weaponry. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the report added that earlier this year, Ukrainian crews who trained with Abrams tank in Germany, tanks in Germany claimed the tanks sometimes failed to hit their targets precisely. But retired U.S. Army General Mark Hartling defended the performance of the Abrams, claiming some of the issues raised, such as the condensation on the tank's instruments, were exaggerated and misleading. Um, anyway, so, you know, that's going to be yet yeah, where awesome British tanks are better than American. But anyway, I thought that'd be of interest. Um, they may well be. Um, I'm really not one to judge. Uh, now, the U.S. supplied disruptor drone has been shot down by Russia implications unraveled so this is part of the ghost drone family the phoenix ghost range that was kind of hotly touted throughout throughout this war has been but it's been completely unknown it's like oh we don't really know what these drones are but they're going to the ukrainians ukrainians are deploying a variety of drones from around the globe um the disruptor drones part of the phoenix ghost family originate uh, from the u.s specifically designed for Ukraine by AVEX Aerospace. They were conceived as a cost-effective means of targeting soft targets using a fragmentation warhead, according to the portal Breaking Defense. These drones are based on the Switchblade 600 drones. Uh, despite their simplicity, these drones were designed to resist GPS signal jamming. However, analyzing the wreckage might boost the effectiveness of Russian electronic warfare systems in the coming months. So uh, we saw a big uh, a TM, a, a T90M tank blow up the Switchblade 600, and I was saying it was a bigger explosion. I wonder if it, it could have been one of these disruptors drones. Anyway, one of the sources, Roy, here, with an embedded tweet, says a down disruptor kamikaze drone, one of the American Phoenix Ghost family of drones, the warhead weighs 22 and a half kilograms, so it's pretty sizable, and can be carried 600 kilometers, wow, by a two-bladed pusher propeller driven by a two-cylinder engine. The resistance of its navigation unit to, resist to Russian GPS jamming is unknown. Um, but yeah, so if, if they come down, though, the, the problem is you then are allowing the Russians to have a look at what's inside and how, how it's made. And, and that's that's a problem. So he goes on to talk about, you know, what appears to be uh, the tech inside these. But um, yeah, that the Russians might have got hold of that. OK, that's enough from me. Thank you very much for your support. Really appreciate it. 
uh, uh, thank you for deciding to come and get your Ukrainian news from ATP Geopolitics. Uh, please check out the description below where there are, um, I don't know, you can buy merch and stuff like that. Uh, nice t-shirts, caps, uh, mouse mats. I just got a, a bit, I needed a bigger mouse mat. I've got an A Tippling Philosopher mouse mat there. Nice big one. Um, so you can get stuff like that. Um, please like, subscribe and share and all that. Uh, that's my spamming bit. I've got loads of books as well. You can buy them. They're, they're linked in the uh, description below. Take care. Speak soon. Bye.